morning, this is David Johnson, and today I'd like to talk about BGSFM, which is the bearing analysis within Hypersizer, and it seems to be the default tool for North America for doing bearing in composites. I think Collier implemented this a few years ago partly when I was working for them, so I helped them uh, to develop this. But before I start, I guess even though we developed this, it's my personal opinion that we have a theoretical method here that needs a huge amount of testing to validate because there's a lot of correction factors. and. It's very expensive from a certification perspective, at least in commercial, the military guys have got a lot more leeway. But for commercial, you've got a lot of Ks to validate, and I'll show that in a, in a minute. And my recommendation is before you even start with this, obviously what you could do is estimate some Ks, correction factors, but before you even start with this, assuming you only have a few laminates, which ironically for bearing, you must stick to within 40%. If you look at this laminate I've chosen here, you must be within 40% to 60% of 45 degrees for this BGSFM to be even valid. And that's good design practice. You must have a lot of 45s at uh, where you need bearing analysis. So, my recommendation if you don't have many laminates is simply to go and test a 40% 45 laminate and a 60% laminate. Do the test results, whatever thicknesses and bolt sizes you've got, assuming there's not too many permutations, just go test it and just use empirical data. Don't even use any of this analysis. But, that said, here we go. I've not actually done an optimization here. I've done a very simple example because I could spend hours talking about this topic and I, and I, I know everyone has a short attention span. So my objective here is really just to give you an introduction to the analysis and for you to go and figure out a few details. What you can do is I, when I was at Collier, I wrote a very detailed BGSFM PowerPoint summary of how all this works and it's very useful and I suggest that you go ask Collier for that PowerPoint to explain the process and, and the parameters. There may be a few things they've changed, but it pretty much looks the same to me. Anyway, let's get started. So I'm in the project sizing form. I've created a project here, just to give you an example. This is just simply a plate. And I'll, I'll go into the details of, so what I'm gonna assume is that I've got a shear here on the edge and I've got some fasteners along the edge. Now for now, for this very simplistic problem, I've assumed that the shear is the same over the whole of this plate. So what I'm gonna do is it could be that I want to find out what size fasteners I need or what thickness laminate I need on, on this edge. And I'll go into a few details of how you could refine this if you say designing a wing later. So what I've done is, for now I just pick one laminate. I didn't want to do an optimization, I just wanted to show how BGSFM works. So what I've done is I've picked a laminate. It's nearly 0.1 thick. It's got 44% 45, so I'm within the, the, the rule, which is very, very important. So let's go back to a few basics. I have a laminate, 0.1 inch thick. I have a material and a layup here, and I've made sure that my 45 plies are between 40% and 60% in the laminate. In Collier, I've picked a Collier laminate. Very important fact that you must understand is that we use pristine allowables for BGSFM. So any allowables that you put into this material here must be pristine. And the laminate I've chosen, I'm not actually optimizing, I'm just trying to show you a BGS of analysis on this laminate. I have a laminate with 18 plies, it's a tape type material, obviously balanced, etc. 
very important thing you must set up before we start. You need to go into your material. And if you look at your joints and holes tab, these two parameters here, see here bolted joints, characteristic distance tension, DOT, characteristic distance compression, DOC. You must have these values, and these values come from test. If you have no values, I suggest you use a mill, uh, mill handbook standard, the composite. I think the standard is 0.015, I don't know, you'd have to go look it up. But anyway, you need to have something in here for this analysis to work, and this isn't something that's not even allowable. So, your, uh, whoever's in charge of material properties, your corporation needs to put something in here for your hypersizer database. One other very important parameter, assuming that you're optimizing, which we're not doing that today, is backdoor data. Go look for bolted joints. Maximum countersink to thickness ratio. Default is 0.8. Some companies, if you're doing uh, primary structures, it could be 0.7. So obviously, if you're trying to optimize a laminate, and this parameter is not correct, you won't get the right answer. So simply change this figure, put 0.7, or you can put it just in here because you just want to do it for the project value. So that's this. We probably normally, for optimizing, we'd have obviously several options here, but I'm not doing that today. I'm just trying to show the BGSFM analysis. We go to the failure tab. And for this BGSM form to work, you must input one of these analyses. We've got a BGS single hole, bolted joint single hole, BGSFM. I have opted to have bearing and bypass load, bearing load only and bypass load only. We put these in, these three, we only need the top one, but we put these others in just to give you a flavor of what's the design driver here. And you can see for this particular one that I'm doing is the minimum margin is 0.3, well, that's quite interesting, 0.37, the actual bearing is 0.33, I'm not quite sure why that's lower, but anyway, but anyway bearing is, uh, is the driver and the bypass load is not really a lot, so again I guess I have to go back and say this tutorial is for more advanced people. If you don't know BGSFM, then this is all kind of a black, black, black box and not very comprehensible. So it took me probably several months to really grasp BGSFM and what it's all about, all the issues and, and how it works. Because basically what we're doing is calculating the bearing stress in five degree increments all the way around the hole. It's a very theoretical method that's uh, calibrated to a test. So what I've done anyway, BGFM selected, I've picked the max strain, as I said earlier, max, most smart companies use a max strain for failure theory for composites, so I've picked strain 1, 2 and, and 1, 2, and just arbitrarily I've picked a buckling load here, but that's not really of any consequence today. The free body diagram, nothing to apply here, in my case I used FEA loads. The FEA tab. If I scroll down, you will see I've used an element peak load. And so what we have here is if you look at the NXs and NYs, my average NY is 200 and my peak is 298. Perhaps what I should do is go in the FEM viewer. And I've, all I've done today is a simple plate. We could imagine this is a wing skin panel with a rib here and a rib here, and a spar. So this is a simplistic example. I only have here, if you look at a component, I only have one component. And so we've averaged the shear. I have a shear on this. So what I'm gonna imagine is, is that this is an edge, and I have to connect this to a spar, so it'll be a row of fasteners along here. Just for this arbitrary example, I've just taken one value of shear because I'm just trying to show the basic principles here. 
So the question comes is everyone says, well, all right, so where's my BGS FM analysis? Well, it's hidden away under the stress tab. If you go down here, this is the detail tab. A lot of data on here. I've already run this one, so that's why some of this stuff's filled in. Anything that's white, you enter the data. The green is filled in automatically by the by the software. It's this green for the for the BGSFM. So to kick off, I, when we did this, I said to Collie, you know, this is really kind of complicated, and we need to expose these variables so the user can see all these variables and this is the one form that I like because I don't have to go into the stress report and go dig around to find out what was done. So if I go into this into this uh, form and just quickly go over it you can see here I have a plate it's a one stack plate there's no stiffness on here. I've said I want a 0.25 inch fastener so this is a standard fastener size for a a standard joint test and I've specified the countersunk depth. Now when we do a test this is where you have to be kind of the expert on BGSFM. When we do a standard test, a standard test is a double shear uh, shear joint and we get some kind of allowable. It's usually for uh, just a standard pan head fastener. So when we do all this testing we have to test with these different items. One of them is a countersink. So a countersunk fastener will not be the same allowable as a pan head. So this is the countersunk correction factor. You need to get from test or you need to estimate something. The joint ex eccentricity correction is because most of our joints are single shear, which has an offset, which has a really bad effect on, on uh, what's going on because the bearing is not uniform in the, in the lamina. Whereas in when we do the standard double shear test, we have a uniform bearing load. So this correction factor is usually fairly significant. So let's call this usually around about 0.65. So what we're saying is, is a single shear joint will, will be a 35% less allowable load than a double shear joint for the same load because of the, the, the moment. Now that's for a, a st standard type thickness of approximately 1 8 Lamina. So obviously that eccentricity depends upon how thick your lamina is. The whole diameter correction, usually the standard test is a 0.25, so if I have a 1032, there could be some correction factor that using a different fastener. Again, must be obtained by test. A thickness correction, again, is a standard thickness for the test. If you're using different thicknesses, you need to have a correction for thickness. We'll assume no correction. There's a fastener fit correction, which is kind of arbitrary, but, you know, uh, the tolerance of the hole has a big effect on the durability of your joint, so we just put this one in just so people could use it if necessary. We also have a KE over D and a KS over D correction factor. Um, there's a hybrid correction if anyone wants to use it because you may use tape and fabric together. Usually these tests are either tape and fabric by themselves. And there's a liquid shim correction factor and a solid shim correction factor and a user defined. So what we've tried to do is just cover all permutations. Not all companies are going to use all of these. You're going to use some, some of these. And much depends on how many laminates you have in your design. If you've only got one or two laminates, it's very straightforward, but if you design a wing with a lot of different configurations, you're, you're going to have a very expensive test program. So there's something for the design and stress engineers to, to take heed here, is you know, keep it simple. You really want to keep as few laminates and fastener sizes as possible. So at the end of the day, we have a cumulative correction factor. So this 0.72 is really the correction factor that you're interested in. This is the correction from the standard 0.25 inch typical thickness double shear uh, canvas, uh, not canvas, uh, double shear uh, lap joint test. And then of course we usually have a fitting factor. Now this fitting factor would be more for kind of a local joint. If we were doing say a wing skin with a continuous continuous joint, let's say we had a 20 fasteners between the two ribs, the fitting factor is not used. 
And that's a very important point. A lot of people get this wrong. So make sure your, current, your fitting factor is applicable. Not, not depends on what type of design you're doing. Okay, so bear with me here. I'm gonna do my best to try and explain how this last part works. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start at the bottom first. And so the analysis for BGSFM, you can pick different failure theories. That's part of BGSFM. The best option or recommended option is to pick max strain. When we run the analysis, in other words, when we click the hypersizer calculate, what happens is hypersizer calculates these bypass loads and it's very important to go back and check a few things. So as you can see I've got minus 500 NX, NY and NXY, these are my bypass. Just a matter of interest, we just gave this option to ignore. Some corporations only have bypass for NX, if you don't have NX and NY in your method you can ignore these two. So we'll leave these, these on. And what I want to do is go back to the loads tab. And notice I've got minus 499.2 here. The point I want to make is look in this table here. Where do you find 499? It's the average. We want the average element loads. And there's a lot of potential to make errors here, and even I might not have got this right, but what I've figured out is really, at least from a BGSM perspective, I tried to click what I normally click, the element-based. I don't want the element peak, but I thought this would give me the average, but when I click element-based, I get peak loads in the bypass. I don't want that. So the only option you can use is this zero sigma average. This is my conclusion after playing around with this. So I don't want to have um, before I had these peak loads, 1935, I don't want these peak loads. We need to have the average, so we need this 500. So these are the loads that I need here. So you must select the correct FEA load. So that said, going back. Hypersizer is doing all the hard work for you. The hard work in BGFM is to calculate the bypass load. So, again, just going back to try and give you some idea of how to set this up for a wing. Let's just imagine this is a wing panel. As I said, a rib here, a rib here, spar, and spar. Ideally, we'd have a small slither of elements down here. Obviously, we've got to be careful of the ratio of length to width. And what should happen is these elements here should have the laminate that you're going to use for the bearing attachment, which will be a lot different to the laminates you have in this region because we need to have at least 40% 45s. Also, this slither of elements down here on the edge will be one component. And what we'll do is we'll size that length of laminate and we'll assume that that attachment is consistent. So there'll be a row of fasteners down here, say 20 fasteners, at say 1.25 pitch. So we like to have 5D for composites and say we've got a quarter inch fastener. So what you do is you would set up between each rib, you would set up for so another rib scene, we set up another component, another component. So each component would be a slither of elements between each of the ribs on your spars. Obviously I don't have a wing model here so I can't show that. Now, the reason we do this is because on our loads model, our wing model, we're very unlikely to have any sea bush elements to with withdraw the uh, force on the fastener. So what we have to do, you've got two options. You can either put the shear load in for the fastener or put the shear, the shear cube for that joint. So what I've done is here is for that, between those two ribs, I've assumed that it's 300 pounds per inch. So we can recover this from the model I ever want to do it in Patran. So this takes a little while to build up the database because you're doing this manually. Hypersize is calculating the bypass load, but you need to put in what you think is a load, shear load on the fastener. So I put a 
a sheer force of sheer force of 300 pounds per inch along that length and I put in the fastener pitch at 1.25. So if you look in the results here we have 300 pounds shear load and hypersize is calculated and said I understand. So in summary we put in a shear load, we put in the fastener pitch and this gives the fastener load to calculate the bearing load. Hypersizer calculates the bypass loads. So then we go on to all of this other uh, information in green, and this is everything that Collier is calculating and displaying on the screen to make it life a lot easier for you. So we have the laminate, we have the thickness, we have the percentage of 0, 45 and 90s. We have the shear load, we have the bearing load, we have all the bypass loads, we have the load set, which if you're optimizing this will be the critical load set. We have a load angle which we can input. We have the characteristic distance values. This effective FBRU is basically just taking P over the allowable load over the area and calculating an effective this was just kind of an FYI to just show roughly what bearing allowable you're getting. And this is the margin of safety, which is the bearing load plus the bypass load. Now here's this, I'll show in a minute the, the, the analysis form, but this is just an analysis doing P over A. So this is a different analysis. So we have two analysis in one here. This is BGSFM, but this is just saying, hey, I'm doing P over A, shear load, bearing force, we have an area and it calculates the FBRU and calculates the margin of safety. Um, I probably would have preferred this on a different form. I think the problem is, is because there's so much information on here, it becomes confusing. I think this actually here needs quite a lot of explanation, and, but you can figure it out by trial and error and we, we prefer to have this as a separate method. I think this is good, but at least, you know, it's a huge improvement. We don't have to go look at the stress report to go and figure out. Imagine having to go to the stress report and try and find all this data to try and figure out what BGFM did rather than just giving a margin. So what I want to do is just explain the, the method here. So as you know, as we said earlier on, if you can remember, when we set up the failure tab, we had to select the BGFM methods and I selected now this this example makes sense I've changed a few numbers from the first form so this minimum margin is the bearing plus the bypass which is margin of 0.99 and this is for the bearing only 1.015 and we have a big margin for the bypass so this 0.9907 is a combination of of the bearing plus the bypass this if you want to fill up the last part of the form this is single home single hole bearing for composite laminates and as you can see that margin is a little bit bigger than this and the reason there's not much difference there is because we don't have a lot of bypass load if we had a big bypass load there would be a big margin difference in margin between the standard bearing analysis and BGSFM so in summary there's a lot of places to go wrong and my recommendation is if you do use Hypersizer for BGSFM, I think you have to have a document to state some of your assumptions and to make sure everybody clicks the correct buttons. That would be my recommendation. Um, I think this is pretty powerful. I found it very useful. I used to hate doing BGSFM by the long hand and having to, most people do them in spreadsheets and it's actually a nightmare. So. I think there's a big benefit to using Hypersizer for BGSFM. I think it can save a great deal of time and you can optimize your laminates much, much more quickly for your uh, edges. And of course that has to integrate with the main laminate and the wing skin. So there's a lot of restrictions on what laminates you can actually use because you have to transition between this laminate for the fasteners and the main wing skin. So I, I think it's a very skilled, you need a very skilled person doing this task. If this is not a task for some for a, this is a really, for a highly skilled person, maybe intermediate could manage it, but definitely not a low skilled task, you're going to get the wrong answer. So 
I'm glad you hang in to the end. I'm sorry this was so long, and I even hardly touched on the subject anyway, but it's a complicated subject. My objective here was really just to show the general capability of Hypersizer, a few of the little quirks, the information you need, and kind of just to set you on your way so that you can perhaps save a little bit of time rather than struggling through uh, a lot of issues as you could probably see as we as we went through all these items. So again, thank you very much and have a good day.